Welcome to the Beyond X podcast. I'm your host, Mahir Abrahimi, and every week I speak to leading industry experts, trailblazers, and market leaders, where we discuss the key topics of our time in detail and have a deep dive conversation on areas like sustainability, technology, urban planning and city design, health and fitness, and more. In today's episode of Beyond Cities, I spoke with Marlon van Maastricht. The first half of our discussion consisted of topics like smart, sustainable cities and the cities of the future, natural integration and landscape design within cities, the importance of accounting for ongoing behavioral changes in city design, and the impact culture and societal change play and can have on sustainability. In the second half of our discussion, we played around with ideas like city hubs, self-sustaining cities, the future of transportation and mobility within cities, the future of hospitality and tourism, and how envisioning our future cities with diversity and inclusion in mind can foster organic growth and prosperity. The different discussion points are all timestamped throughout the episode, so you can freely move around as you see fit. Marlon is a Saudi and Dubai-based Dutch urbanist with well over two decades of experience in the planning, design, and engineering of our natural and built environment. And he has a particularly deep embedded passion to improve the quality of life on his journey through the development of our cities and their public realm. Marlon's background is in landscape architecture and urban planning, and he recently extended his toolkit with a master's degree in city sciences to keep up and stay ahead of the curve on his creative quest within the context and application of today's digitized world and the challenges and opportunities of rapidly and infinitely evolving technologies. Martin started the year by joining the Red Sea Global as a director of landscape architecture for design and project delivery, where he found his calling as he shares RSG sustainability pillars and strongly identifies with their motto for people and planet. Martin is a desired and experienced multidisciplinary expert frequently requested as keynote speaker, panelist, and moderator at regional industry events and work groups, having spent his career living and working in Europe, Asia, and the Middle East, and in Saudi Arabia and the UAE since 2008. This is in fact how we've met and collaborated on many occasions over the years, so I'm really looking forward to catching up with him and picking his brain on a few hot topics within the industry. So thank you so much, Marlon, for joining us today. Um, Most welcome. Great to finally <laughs> have you here. Yeah, but, yeah, I it took a minute. Took a minute. I know it's a bit of a pet peeve of yours. The word "smart" when it's put in <laughs> before anything that is technologically advanced, smart city, smart this, smart that, and I think a lot of times people almost confuse the digital side of things with smart. So, yeah, it's amazing that we can go on Zoom and Teams and whatever other programs are there. We're very platform agnostic, but whatever programs are there, we can use them to just communicate and chat with each other but that's not really smart that's just that's technology that existed six seven years ago so let's start with definitions what would you consider is just smart technologies like what is smart to you smart cities indeed i find i don't like to use the term for me it's just future cities or future communities Mm -hmm. or just more to the core of what we're trying to do in our profession smart comes closer to the iot of course being generation x having lived through the time where the first mobile phones came into place, where you could play Snake and where there was no WhatsApp, social media coming on, even in our profession from AutoCAD to 3D to BIM. So having lived through that transitional phase or both being part of that generation, I think you can appreciate the before and the after and the now. And for me, technology is baseline. You always want to be as smart as possible Mm -hmm. because smart is defined as doing things in a better way, right? And technology is always going to continue to evolve. And for us as planners or designers, part of, let's say, urban development or rural development in the widest form or just project development in general, is trying to use all those technologies for the better of both how we do our work and ultimately, obviously, the outcome for the end user, for the planet as well. So in that sense, smart is really back to the devices itself, IoT, the Internet of Things. So everything collects data at the moment. Let's start with the most simplest from your phone. Or, for example, in our project, we have in our core, we have thousands 
of trackers so mm -hmm. that we can monitor our progress in the Red Sea of our conservation targets mm -hmm. that we have. So where, for example, we have coral farms, we are trying to not just preserve, but regenerate certain species or ecosystems like the reef itself, but also, for example, endangered species like the hawksbill turtle. So we are able to track our progress there. And as from a designer or an architect's point of view, obviously in the most simple form, I would say from going from 2D on paper, being able now to have a 3D model and work on a project in, let's say, 10 different countries mm -hmm. with a team of maybe more than two, 300 people at the time uh, on a single asset, for example, is amazing because now you can not only just see everything in 3D between the architecture as a design, structure, MEP, all the info services, and have what we call clash detection, you can also write scenarios in programs to map out the effect of certain things that could be in an aesthetical way, could be in a functional way. And for example, things like mobility, knowing how much users you're going to have in an asset or in a city, how you can improve, for example, traffic management, big issue, obviously, trying to remove traffic jams, reduce the time that you spend on the road, to you now the transition from the um, resources that we use, like the oil and gas, to electric vehicles and autonomous vehicles to get from A to B. So mm -hmm. technology is basically in everything. So of course, if you would argue on a technological level or a digital level, you, I understand that the term smart city came because everything came online and we everything can give you information and we're doing, we can do something with that information. It's not always for the good, sometimes for the bad as well. Yeah, yeah. And it is our duty as planners and designers to, to always keep challenging the status quo. Mm -hmm. I think that's in our DNA as planners and designers. That's why we do or chose to do what we do. And it's also our duty as a professional. And when it comes to how we look at the development of communities mm -hmm. or cities or the public realm, I think, again, it's a, a means to an end and always trying to see what the most appropriate and current technology or process is to achieve new objectives and or improve old ones. We didn't really settle on a definition there, but you talked about all the possible things you can do with smart technologies. The it, definition of smart, if you want to go back to what the, the definition of smart, I think I did mention, is to do something better, right? Okay. A smart way is doing, is doing things more efficiently, mm -hmm. or for example, when you talk about environment, less damaging, or even in regeneration, instead of making an imprint, and talking about waste, looking at how we can convert that into something positive, mm -hmm. for example, like green waste into compost, into nutrition to get cradle to cradle as we right. go to the start. So actually that is a process that doesn't even need technology. That's yeah. why I'm always saying a smart city for me is about sustainability. It's about user comfort mm -hmm. for me. I, you're really smart. If you can deal with our climate and our weather here, we're trying to reduce the average temperature in the hottest month between June and September and still being able to walk outside with the amount of shade or humidity control, mm -hmm. climate control in, in general, changing a, a microclimate that makes it more comfortable for us to use when it is 42 degrees outside. Yeah and you want to walk from your home to the bus stop or to the metro, yeah, those are day-to-day -day challenges that we have. And then trying to not take the car that pollutes, but taking another means of transport, those are all smart mm. solutions that you could argue are part of trying to create smarter communities, smarter designs. So I think to define it, I don't define a smart city only smarter because it has more technology. Right. A smarter city 
is smarter in the way it applies technology okay. for the better of its user and its environment. In the most efficient way possible. In the most efficient way possible. Okay. And with the best outcome. Mm -hmm. And that is also economic, it's environmental, it's efficiency, it's quality. And quality has many, many aspects to it. Just the way things work and make them efficient in terms of time, mm -hmm. time consumption, you could argue is quality, but also the experience. And that's a very big part of things. We, we build cities to work and to live, but a big part of life and, and a happy trend that I see now where the technology itself was the hot topic, smart cities for me. Personally, as you know, indeed one of my pet peeves is because it was largely a technology industry introduced yeah, yeah. term to push product and as urban planners and landscape architects, engineers even were trying to really shift the focus back at the outcome itself and changing the world for a better place. And uh, it's a bit cuddly fuddly, but, but that's but the aim, right? That yeah, is they, the like, aim. Yeah. If you have that in the sort of design stage, if you think about that as a principle, then I think it just sets everything up. Even if it doesn't always end up reaching the top of the pyramid, at least it's there somewhere in the foundations, right? And that's a key factor. Yeah. And some designs are just made to be funky and cool, and that's fine. It's also part of a customer experience. But personally, as a, as a passionate landscape architect and environmental manager, also with an interest in technology, I don't know, I just wake up with a bigger smile if I do something good. And right. If I work on something that I know will benefit the next generation and so on, and that contribute to something. And I love finding that the two do not have to be mutually yeah. exclusive. You can do something funky, crazy, wild, and still achieve sustainability targets and be environmentally responsible. Mm. And and I find that smart too. <laughs> yeah, that makes so, sense. So, yeah, you know, yeah. that's, that's smart too. As designers, per definition, you could argue smart is not just something about intelligence. It's about EQ as well, mm. emotional intelligence through design. That's a really good point because I think when you say smart cities, everyone always thinks about technology, right? Like we were really thinking about the technology because I guess it's a bit more sexy. It, Especially I think from some of the movies we grew up on, right? Like where you see these cool things happening. I won't name movie names, but like futuristic cities where the cars yeah. drive themselves and you're interstellar travel is possible and all these things. We think about the technology, but I guess as a designer, really what you need to do is think about the people and the user journey, right? Like how is somebody going to use this design or this plan or this principle? In reality, how is it going to happen? You know that I've used those examples in my keynote sometimes. Mm -hmm. I don't know which exact date, but in the 80s, Total Recall with Arnold Schwarzenegger yeah, yeah. with the self-driving car and Fifth Element, indeed, all these movies, they had visions of technology that now are reality mm -hmm. that's also something we have today the what we've dreamed is now a reality and now the goalpost has shifted mm -hmm. in ways in scary ways i think i read yesterday that including elon musk and a whole bunch of tech entrepreneurs and scientists have have really urged to slow down on ai yeah because it's getting out of control and going back to the film film example, we don't want Terminator <laughs> 8 to happen, <laughs> that, that our technology becomes yeah, self-aware yeah. and thinks these humans are screwing up the place. Let's just eliminate the, most, the biggest danger factor, and that's us. Yeah, yeah. And it's actually not surreal to think mm. that. It no, is. It, 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 machine yeah. learning is a computer can outsmart you against smart. In, in, a, in a fraction of a second, a million times. Yeah. Forgive me for the exact numbers. No, it's no, scary. But that's but, the thing. Um, and I really, <laughs> I don't want to go that direction, but I'm just saying if we take those 80s examples and we see that's now a reality where driverless cars or even autonomous flying taxis are something we're going to see within the next five years, whether it's in a demo form or, you know, it's going to be just for the hyper elite. Things are standardizing. 
the USB example that we had between the floppy disk that mm. we used at school to Jesus. the tiny little USB with two terabytes on it. I feel like 30% of the audience is not going to know what a floppy disk is, but... <laughs> exactly, yeah, yeah, this is it. Or, like, or a DVD-ROM. <laughs> okay, let's go. Growing up with Legos, we were talking about it off yeah, camera yeah. just now. I grew up with Legos. I grew up with technical Legos. Mm -hmm. And then my little nephew, and I think at the time was nine or ten probably, was asking for Christmas to have a remote sensor, remote control sensor for his, for his robotic Legos. And he was programming on an iPad with Python. Yeah. Mind yeah. blown. Yeah. yeah. And that's, yeah, that's also a generational thing. So the young generation that, that was born into this technology, they look at us as fossils. But that's the thing, right? It's almost like we were doing things with our hands tied behind our backs and people who are in their 60s and 70s in this industry who were doing things really with their hands and feet and faces yeah. <laughs> tied behind their backs. But it's just what you can do now with so much less effort. Yeah. It just compounds what you can really get out. At the end of the day, it's much more efficient, as we were saying yeah. about the smart stuff. So. It's, and it's all part of evolution. And you also see it's going to go to the ends of the spectrum. But I am romantic to the older generation's idea of we didn't have anything, we had to entertain ourselves, yeah. hence we became more creative. You see an equal trend that moves away from technology and says, okay, I'd like to go to a resort where there's no Wi-Fi, mm -hmm. or I'd like to explore maybe a part of cultural history or architecture, whether modern or just being in the moment. Mm -hmm or having a conversation like we're having now and sitting down and having a chat versus having a Teams call. Scientifically, there is a value. There is a different energy when you're sitting across from each other. And there's a place for everything. But for me, again, going back to why I don't like to use the word smart, sometimes you need to also disconnect from technology mm -hmm. to connect to one another. and that makes the difference between being human being and turning into a robot yeah, yeah. for sure. And, and I think that's also a very interesting, infinite challenge and opportunity. And as a designer and as a planner, I'd like to always uh, try to think in solutions, not so much in problems. And that's always an interesting tug of war, if you will, between function and aesthetics mm -hmm. and technology but in my opinion it's technology is the baseline we work with what we have mm -hmm. or we try to push the boundaries which is the most interesting sort of spectrum trying to push the boundaries of either existing technology or invent something new and sometimes so not to reinvent the wheel and sometimes to invent the wheel sometimes also just to do something nice and normal like picking up a pencil and doing an old school sketch versus right something on an iPad or in BIM 360, a fully automated markup. Everything has its place and its time. And that's it. You mentioned AI. There's implications in design now as well, right? Where you can tell, not ChatGPT, but similar software. Okay, I want this and this in a concept. So I want a fully sustainable city that's going to have full e-mobility and a lot of native plants and all of these things. Design this for me and it can try to do that. Obviously, it won't be as effective as at least at the moment right as a, well as a yeah as a person designing it so i mean to jump into that maybe what do you think are the shortcomings let's say of our current cities that technology isn't addressing but it could maybe like you said maybe we need to reinvent some things especially when we're talking about the people right like how is it impacting people what is missing at the moment i think first of all obviously i'm already biased because i'm a landscape architect but if I try to be as objective as possible within our Gulf context, but basically within any context, because where we deal with the hot season mm -hmm. versus the, um, let's say, usable season and trying to stretch that season as long as possible to make things comfortable, actually has very little to do with technology. We can utilize technology for it, but usually planting some trees, okay. as simple as that. Mm -hmm. And of course, we can loop in the technology into the conversation, for example, with 
subsoil drainage in order to minimize evaporation and have have that tree drink as a, a waste as little drink water or water as it possibly can there are certain things that w that really come down to the basics as well and if you think about the city fabric as a place where we either live or work or visit it's going to be always one of the three where we all have to use the same public domain to get from a to b or to spend time the public domain itself yes technology is going to help us for example move, let's say it's a huge step already to move from petrol based transport to electric fantastic but for us to walk outside even on that electric scooter or on that electric bicycle that still doesn't do anything for your health <laughs> but gets you from a to b exposed outside is shading is yeah trying to influence the microclimate so what can we do better i think in a lot of cities in the middle east are younger from its conception if you look at dubai is let's say started only in the last three decades with public transport mm -hmm. and obviously the key drivers in the beginning is healthcare is transport is economy tourism and destinations and then the actual fabric right. will catch up and it's very logical and normal that the primary infrastructure will go first now with the technology as head to hand we can fast track and you see probably if you put this into a graph you can see that is exponentially growing yeah we cannot discount the human factor in that it's the attitude of of the regional and the will and the drive of the regional leadership and its locals whether you're in Saudi or in the emirates or in any of the gulf countries to drive and propel their countries forward is also as important as the technology itself is mm -hmm. it's utilizing that technology as we said earlier on for the greater good and within our cities what can go what we have to manage is to always keep the focus in the right place so we are uh, a referee if you will or a facilitator to make sure again that the technology is a means to an end mm -hmm. and the big corporations are always going to push product which is great competition in that breeds innovation and it's then for us to take that innovation and have it serve both us as a human beings and nature and the planet in general yeah sorry it's part of our it's the red sea has it for people and planet and i think and this is one of the reasons why i joined the red sea global as well to have that as your center pillar is for me the core and the essence and driver for everything that we do professionally mm -hmm. and even personally i think many designers or architects or planners will tell you that this is like a chosen destiny it's more than just your day to we don't punch in and punch out yeah we live that when we go on holiday when we spend our time the way we the way we design our houses or our little terrace where we recreate in the weekends or places we visit it's part of our dna right. and so is it with mine and i find technology very exciting and at the same time yeah i'm a little bit on the fence i love to do things old school way yeah. i guess that's a generational thing probably i think it's a mindset thing more than a generational Maybe. thing but yeah i get what you mean though. maybe it's a dutch thing but <laughs> uh, yeah i wouldn't yeah okay we've invented the polar model <laughs> which as a sub explanation is making a meeting about a committee <laughs> i have to say i that a lot of my colleagues uh, or my friends are quite the opposite of that we'd like to do instead of let's say walk the walk not just talk the talk so or like, bike the bike <laughs> bike the bike exactly <laughs> indeed indeed yeah you touched on some of the health benefits of landscape i think one of the things i really noticed myself during covid was i mean I, for your industry was a bit different but for ours events weren't really happening not a lot was happening so we were figuring things out for the first couple of months and it gave people a lot of time to just venture into the unknown and see what's happening and what gave me that sort of clarity of mind and calm was just being in nature just going on the balcony and looking at the greenery or 
going in a park and just going for a walk, which was the only time you were allowed to remove your yeah. mask was in, in parks and whatnot so you could exercise. It, it just does this thing where it's not the health benefits in the normal sense that we talk about, but the mental health benefits of just calming and clarity of mind and just lifting that cloud. So I'm really curious, both in the perspective of someone who's doing landscape design for upcoming cities, but really when you go into existing cities and not just in the Gulf, let's say like in London or Amsterdam, what are the important concepts to keep in mind? Like how can we look at nature, natural integration, and especially horticulture when it comes to these kind of things, when it comes to designing for health and mental health? I think it's a very nice point and a good point because I experienced the same. I would say on a professional level during the COVID, we were forced um, our digital transformation, as we call it, was accelerated massively. We had to go on Teams, on Zoom. It allowed some of the, let's say, more traditional companies, it forced them uh, to think globally. So it opened up a lot of doors at the same time. And you're right. I think the, the fact that we were so disconnected on a human level with the masks and the social distancing also created an urge back to human connection yeah. and to social connectivity and to mental health indeed. And I would say that, no, I would say it is, it's scientifically proven. Nature has a positive effect. We need exercise biologically. We need oxygen in our blood and in our veins to function as a human being, but also stress hormones literally and can physically bring you down. So depression, trauma, or just the downside of being unhealthy, diabetes, mm -hmm. obesity, high blood pressure, heart. It is our duty when you look at how we plan our cities. I think COVID has amplified and I think everybody has like, ah, finally, we can just sit down like we're doing now. We can have a chat. And we do look for that human connection more and we look indeed, like you said, to go out in nature and to have fresh air and to be inspired for us and for our cities to have our environment high up the agenda is our duty. We're using up the planet fast and I don't want to put a Greenpeace head on and I don't have to. The, the facts are there. Global warming is there. The impacts of it are very much known. Let's say if in five years, 10 years, we have a moon base and we can go to Mars. I don't think we're going to live to see the day we're going to walk into a forest on a different planet yet. Maybe our children, maybe our grandchildren. However, I don't like to think on the basis that this is a requirement because we screwed up our planet yeah. and we have nowhere else to go. And I think it's unnecessary. We are finding that we can coexist, that we can work with nature instead of against it. it was very nice, um, a quote by Mr. Attenborough, which our Scott Haines show uh, presented internally on a webinar for one of our projects. It's very, it's key. So I really get energized and I feel it's also my duty as a professional, but also socially to take everything that I've learned and that I'm still learning and use it for the better good, for improving our living conditions. And yeah, also uh, making cool things but cool things that are responsible that give back to nature. And I get a kick out of that, mm -hmm. to be honest, to do something funky and still have it be uh, net positive. Right. Like what we're trying to achieve and what we're going to achieve, I think we're going to shatter the target, is 30% conservation benefit by 2040. And it's amazing that you can that we can do that and very privileged that I can be a part of that, especially as a landscape architect. Cause... Break that down for me. What does that mean in layman's terms, 30% conservation? Okay. So I work for the Red Sea Global. The two known projects of that are the Red Sea Development, mm -hmm. which is 500 kilometer above Jeddah. And then 200 kilometer further north is Amala. Both these projects combined are 32,000 hectare for reference that is bigger than Belgium. So we have 
we've taken a very large portion over 260 plus 68, I think, a uh, kilometer of coastline and we're developing both on land and in the ocean, we're developing a tourist destination. The focus of it is to have not just a minimum imprint and building there with minimum impact on nature, for example, by having offsite manufacturing. As you may know, Shebara Island is done by UAE's Killa Design, are these stainless steel pods that are manufactured off-site and now are being installed so that uh, the interface between that completely self-sustainable hotel room, if you will, is just being brought in and put on site with minimum damage and minimum impact. And we go further. For every mangrove tree that we damage during construction, we grow three back. We have a nursery that is now the biggest nursery in the Middle East that has over 9 million plants wow. and just growing your own plants and you can control the water consumption, you can use the organic waste and get it back into the cycle of composting it, fertilizing it, using it for your own, to the logistics of growing the plants closest to site as possible and having less transportation costs and all these things combined. And I can really, I can go on for hours, but the entire Red Sea development, the Red Sea global portfolio is completely net zero in terms of energy consumption. For example, our airport and our developments are going to be 100% reliant on a solar farm that we've built, which is the biggest battery in the world. Literally, having people come in and take electric vehicles to their respective resort units or mm -hmm. hotel rooms so being completely carbon neutral and being able to not just preserve, but regenerate coral reef, reintroduce species that are uh, endangered, like the hawksbill turtle, their nesting grounds, is amazing. It's really exhilarating. And to give you an example, the Red Sea has 92 islands. We are only developing 20 of those, which is 30%. But... In total, of that area of 28,000 for the Red Sea, we're only developing 1%. Wow. 1%. So the rest would be immersed into... The rest we are is the natural experience. So we have the mountain ranges mm -hmm. with ancient historical sites. We have, obviously, that transition towards the dune landscape, like the Southern Dunes is one of the first assets that's going to come online. That's going to be open this year. It's going to be a, a Ritz Carlton mm -hmm. hotel with uh, a completely immersed dune landscape approach. So you have Desert Rock is one of the hotels, literally as part of the mountain. And then you have the islands itself with the underwater and above water experience. So it's an amazing tourist generation that has reinvented touristic destination development by adding versus destroying, let's say. That's amazing. Yeah, it is. I want to touch more on this, but I think before we move on to new developments, new cities, future sure. cities, I want to kind of go full circle on existing cities, especially, I think the Middle East is a great example of cool things you can do with when you have the finances, the people, and the technology to push things forward. But when you are talking about other metropolitan areas, say London, Amsterdam, where you're more limited by what you can build outwards, obviously, and what you can do inwards, because a lot of times you can't really go out of no. London continuously and just keep expanding the metropolitan area. It's already There's already things there. Yeah. So what are your thoughts on that? If you want to incorporate more natural integration, if you want to just incorporate more interesting designs, what are some things that can be done into existing cities outside of just building new things? London and Amsterdam are very good examples where the city centers are made car-free mm -hmm. to the dismay of some of the taxi drivers mm -hmm. who are now forced to switch to hybrid, like the London cabs are going to be completely hybrid already mm -hmm. and eventually electric. So, of course, the public transport is one of the controllable things. Private transport is another. For example, the taxes on private cars in 
increasing categories of weight and size and pollution are astronomical. Mm -hmm. So governments are helping, uh, almost forcing people to consider switching to electric vehicles uh, by, for example, it's carrot and steak, subsidizing, let's say, buying a Tesla versus mm -hmm. an SUV that runs on diesel. You're going to pay a fortune for the latter, and you're going to be able to deduct, for example, from your taxes, the Tesla. And these are sort of policy tools that are very strong and instrumental that I would say have a little bit of a longer lifespan or maybe have been tested longer. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, the underground in London and the tram system in Amsterdam are there for decennia. So these are things that we can learn from and that we can take away. We are uh, Dubai and even whether you go to Qatar or I think the Middle East is very much tapped into the global scene and the global comparison. So mm -hmm. I would say that one of those aspects, let's say, of mobility is something that we're doing very well. And let's say we're further advanced in dealing with that. Indeed, smaller, a country like Holland, where you have 17 million inhabitants on a space which, for example, Saudi is 23 million, I believe right. now. Uh, which is the size of Europe, if you look at that level of density, it also forces us to make indeed smarter solutions to deal with that kind of density. And, you know, if you come to Holland or you come to London, it's still very green. It's still, the cities are very much green. The trees are a prerequisite and public green and biophilic design within the urban fabric are the norm are the baseline. So I think having that embedded in policy so that it doesn't become a matter of political agenda, mm -hmm. but more like something that is regionally or nationally trickled down. For example, in Holland, you have a national plan, then the provinces will take that over, which gets trickled down to municipal policy I think that's something that we in the Middle East we can still take away further. For example, in Abu Dhabi with the public realm development guidelines, you're just not going to get a building permit if you do not have these goals. And for example, we're going to have 75 hotels across the Red Sea portfolio. Every single operator that signs on signs their our commitment to sustainability mm -hmm. when we make this big bold statements, it's not just something trendy, no, we, we You're being held accountable. We are held accountable and we hold people that asso associate themselves with us also accountable mm -hmm. to contribute. So when it comes to development in general, whether it's urban, rural, touristic, recreational, mobility, in all aspects of planning, policy transform is a, a very big topic that you will find in each society sit on a different level. Outside of policy, what else do you think is important? So obviously, I think from everything you said, whether it's transportation, whether it's planning, whether it's just sustainability as a whole, policy plays a large part, and I completely agree with that. But what else? Can people really make a big difference? Can the design principles themselves, especially, again, for both existing and future cities, can they play a key role too? Yeah, I would say culture. Okay. So, yes, the people, you're right. Policy is an instrument that is used by people. I mean, if we take the AI off the table and assume <laughs> that people are going to be running the show for, for a while longer. <laughs> yeah, assuming that we're still in control. Um, for example, we've seen that here in the deserts, in any of the Gulf, the wasteful culture going and going desert camping and just leaving all the rubbish yeah. behind and in the ocean. Yeah. It's a disgrace. And I'm very glad that initiatives like Zero Plastic are coming in, but they can't come fast enough. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying that we're not doing it, but in my opinion, we're never doing enough. And what really helps is education and education from a young age. So... As a landscape architect, for example, educational playgrounds that suit the theme 
of our developments. Our developments are fully nature-based mm -hmm. and nature-driven, whether it's with funky architectural or not. No, you're still there to go on this journey and to experience whether it's uh, the coral or swimming or water sports or kayaking in the mangroves or climbing mountains. You're there to experience something. So to instill an appreciation and a respect for nature from an early age has to do with exposing people to what we're doing, which is on a positive level, but also the negative. And again, we like to focus on the positive by leading by example, but it is important that we are accountable for what we do. And that takes a cultural shift of which I think we're still in a very early stage in the Middle East. For example, separating your domestic waste is something that I can remember since I was a child. Maybe I, I think as far back as my teens, we had a gray and a green and a yellow container and a little glass box. We're talking what, 90s? Yeah, so that's early 90s. And now we're doing that, we're adopting that. But we still have a long ways mm -hmm. to go in the hotels, the waste. Uh, those buffets, the brunches, but let's say that you have a buffet where you pay an amount of money for three hours where you can eat all you can. So all... much food waste. <laughs> yeah, no, it's so true. I always think about it in a very basic way. The amount of money they're wasting because of not planning it correctly is, it has to be a, a factor, right? Because that's how you convince businesses. But the sheer wastage of Tons and tons of food. Even if you take a, another segue back into the technology, unless you're really well off, nobody can afford a brunch here without using the entertainer or Groupon or whatever yeah. app you're using to get the buy one, get one free. There's data created through that because the price is fixed of the buffet, for example. And also the amount of packs that go into a venue is also something fixed. So you're right, that data, this is a very good example where we have the technology that we can see how much wastage there yeah. is on each type of consumption. And I appreciate, for example, in some of the assets where you have an a la carte, mm -hmm. whatever you want with certain choices of dishes. And there is such a wide offering here that whether you're more the vegan type or the carnivore or, you know, more the eco type or uh, the gluttonous one, you can satisfy yourself. And we can calculate more in detail when you do a certain amount of courses. Mm -hmm. So this is one of the examples where I do feel that we can utilize technology for the better. It's happening. I'm not saying it's not happening. But when it comes to how much damage we're causing and for example food wastage versus how much we're doing mm -hmm. in terms of utilizing that technology i think we still have a long ways to go fair okay yeah so anyone who wants to be environmentally sustainable cannot go to buffets anymore that's that's a note that we're gonna put don't just recycle also don't go to buffets <laughs> yeah, 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 to an extent. I don't want to be a party pooper. Either. No, no, but I, but I think it makes perfect sense. Le, le, yeah, let's, you know, there's always extremes. I think, again, going back to culture, Yeah. I think the way that you raise your children or the way that you think as groups, maybe people that you associate with, you can already making a difference. Indeed, let's say if we were to meet up on a personal level and we go out with a couple of couples to say, okay, let's support this local cafe, yeah. which is done purely with produce that's grown in the UAE or in Saudi farm to table versus going to a buffet. Yeah, then I personally feel good afterwards. Yeah. I do. And this is not, again, I'm not wearing sandals as you can <laughs> see or singing Kumbaya with the guitar. No, this is something that you do have control over mm -hmm. and it has a massive impact. And maybe because I have an environmental background yeah. and because I'm a landscape architect, I care for it more. But I, yeah, I don't know. I think that's something that we still have a long ways to go. And I find it a bit more entrenched, and this is normal, but we're in a first world country. I don't want to 
labeled by how much money you have to spend. Although I do feel that the more money you have to spend, the more responsibility you have. Unfortunately, reality is usually the other way around. But let's say versus a third world country where you're just fighting for a clean drop of water versus a first world country, which all of these countries are, I think that the big objectives in terms of growth, number one, is our duty to the planet and is our duty to future generations. And in that sense, we have a duty to, to instill better values in our children and to lead by example as individuals and human beings and definitely as professionals because right. we're, we're having a podcast now for our industry within our industry and I doubt you'll find an architect or a planner or even an engineer that is completely screw the context and I'm just gonna we were talking about it earlier just tarmat this park and build a yeah, parking yeah, lot. Yeah, yeah. I think if you can do things the right way, it doesn't mean that you have to do things boringly. You can do funky, funky things in an environmentally responsible way. And that's the sweet spot. That's in terms of culture, mentality, the way we approach things. And yeah, I feel that where I'm at now in life and in in my career in, and being associated with Red Sea, I am where I'm supposed to be. Every single detail that we're doing, we're trying to work towards those kind of objectives. And that's really cool. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Makes sense. Okay.